There's a lot of reasons that I love working at the Heroes Journal. There's the people I get to work with and there's the reviews I get to read of people using our products. But one of my favorites is the fact that because we're a nerdy company, I get to read fiction and call it uh, business research. So a year ago, I had a different job. A uh, job that I loved, but I was a marketer in a fairly corporate company. And even back then, I had a little bit of a reputation for reading fiction. And I wouldn't just read fiction on my lunch break or in my car or stuff Lord of the Rings inside the dust jacket of a different book. I would actually read fiction openly. I would read fiction at my desk and I wouldn't just do that. I would actually try to convince anybody who would listen that they needed to read fiction too. Today, I wanna to talk about why. See, fiction is immensely entertaining, oftentimes far more entertaining than many works in nonfiction. You think about your favorite epic stories or fandoms or classics. Uh, but I think that if fiction was only entertaining or if that's all it offered, that we probably wouldn't be talking about it today as much as we are. See, if you go back thousands of years to a time when human life was pretty much across the board a little bit more difficult, instead of spending your time selecting what you wanted to watch on Netflix or browsing through Uber Eats, you probably spent your time trying to tend the fields or have enough food for winter. And people back then told stories. In fact, if you look at the stories that they wrote down or the very, very first things they wrote down, they weren't histories, they weren't physics textbooks, they weren't mathematics, they were actually fiction the stories that they told that brought a sense of meaning. See, nonfiction is amazing. There are many books of nonfiction that I love from biographies to personal help books and everything in between. But nonfiction has one central limiting factor. It's limited to the real world. The real world is complicated. It's nuanced. With almost any opinion, you can find somebody who disagrees. In fiction, you can isolate some of those realities. You can imagine, hey, what would it, look like to make the evilest evil wizard of all time? Or what would the noblest of all noble kings be like? You can start playing with the archetypal truths and seeing how they bounce off of each other and then begin to see how those things are reflected in your life. And that I think starts to get at the core of why fiction is so important. So today I wanna to talk about seven of my favorite fiction books and some of the lessons that I think they have to offer us in the 21st century. Let's get into it. The first book I wanna talk about is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is a copy I bought when I was, think I was 14 years old. There's a wax on the front, I don't know how. A lot of the pages are waterlogged or coffee stained because I've read this book countless number of times. So on the surface, it's a viciously funny sci-fi novel about a man hitchhiking his way around the galaxy. But underneath, I think there's a shocking level of insight in this book about life in the 21st century, from the babblefish and the effects of language all the way to the infinite improbability drive. I think that this book explores the kind of nihilism that tends to arrive from living life in the modern century and finds a much more lighthearted approach to it. Marvin, you saved our lives. I know. Wretched, isn't it? I also love The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because it's one of the oldest stories. It's a story about somebody being forced out of their home before they're ready to leave, trying to figure out how do they get back home or at least find a place in the world where they belong now. And while The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the 21st century version of that, the second book I wanna talk about is perhaps the oldest version of that, The Odyssey by Homer. Now, The Odyssey, for many people, brings up bad memories of an English 101 class in high school or maybe reading it and not understanding it in college. But I think of the Iliad and the Odyssey that the Odyssey is the far more relevant one to us today. The Odyssey is the story of Odysseus who is trying to make his way home after a great war. And it's about him trying to find his place in the world, but he faces all of these challenges before he can get there. He's the leader of a group of men, but he can't really keep them under control. And because he can't keep them under control, he's delayed because they eat the oxen they weren't supposed to eat or the different challenges and things that he has to face that are actually externalizations of his internal shortcomings. And see, the story of Odysseus isn't just the story of a person being subjected to the worst luck in history. It's actually the story of somebody with critical flaws, critical flaws that are stopping him from being able to find his place in the world. And in order to find his place in the world, he has to undertake that adventure and go through that transformation. Now, the next book on this list is just as ancient in the sense of its source material, though it was written much more recently, and that is The Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. I've been a Stephen Pressfield fan for a long time because of the War of Art, but I found this book more recently. Now, this is a book about the 300 Spartans and the Battle of Thermopylae, but it's a little bit different than the movie 300. This is Sparta! See, this isn't just about an epic battle scene of slashing through enemies and Russell Crowe looking absolutely shredded, spitting off one-liners. Spartans, prepare for 
glory. Because while this book captures that same epic scale, the kind that you maybe find in a YouTube montage, I think at its core, it's actually about a much quieter form of courage. See, I said before that modern life is very complicated and most real life situations are very nuanced. And in the face of that, I think we all have to answer the question of what do we believe the right thing to do is? What is the nature of virtue, of character, of right action? And at the end of this book, the very last quote is the epitaph on the plaque that used to be at Thermopylae. And it goes like this, it says, tell the Spartans, strangers passing by, that here obedient to their laws we lie. The book Gates of Fire isn't just about the bravado of the last stand of an impossible battle to win. It's asking the question of what idea is so powerful, what virtue is so noble that you would be willing to do that. And I think in the face of having to make those decisions in far more ordinary ways, it's a powerful reflection on the nature of character and virtue. But while Gates of Fire is about the nature of virtue and character in an uncertain world, this next book is more directly about that uncertainty. And that is The Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pynchon. This is kind of a spin or riff on a detective novel, a deeply postmodern romp through many of the literary theory ideas of the 20th century, but embodied not in a college textbook or class at a 400 level, but instead in a beautiful story. One that I think leaves you with probably more questions than answers. Questions that I think we've felt even if we didn't know how to ask them. See, I love books like this, like The Crying of Lot 49, not just because it's a brilliantly written book and a very enjoyable read, but because it takes source material that is so complex and difficult that it normally only lives in an academic setting and brings it back into the place that it was actually born out of. The ordinary struggles of ordinary people trying to figure out how to navigate their lives. This next book I wanna talk about is Not Actually The Stranger by Albert Camus. It's a lesser known book by Camus, The Fall. The Fall is interesting for a number of reasons. It's written in the second person, so it's somebody talking to you instead of a narrator talking. And it's about the bystander effect, the question of what happens to somebody when they spend their whole entire life questioning whether or not they should act instead of acting. And it paints kind of a dismal picture. I think it's a powerful lesson about the locus of control and seeing yourself as the primary driver in your story and the negative things that can happen to you and how far it can go when you see yourself as just a bystander of your own life. Now this next book, or rather series of books, is a little bit different, and that is The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. This is actually the box set I grew up reading. I remember falling in love with the world of Narnia and the characters of Edmund and Lucy and Peter. And I love these books because while well, many classics and great science fiction or fantasy books are thousands of pages long or dealing with super heady ideas, these books do the opposite, something that is oftentimes, I think, even harder. See, it's easy to take a complicated idea and talk about it in a complicated way, but these books take complicated ideas of stories and imagination and allegories and virtues and morals, and they put them into very simple, very beautiful books that are wonderfully told and wonderful, kind worlds to revisit. Now, you're gonna have to trust me on this final book, and I'm hoping that if you've watched this far, that your eyes aren't gonna glaze over when I tell you that the final book on this list is Moby Dick by Herman Meville. Now, I feel like this book has more than a little bit of a reputation for being impossible to read. People joke about how long it is, about how boring it is, but I actually think there's a reason for that because I actually think it's kind of intentional on the part of the author. See, this is a book about a voyage. It's about Ishmael and the Pequod and Captain Ahab and ultimately the white whale, Moby Dick. And for years at a time on this voyage, nothing happens. And so the center of this book is full of long moments of watching the waves and not seeing land and discourses on whales and humanity and religion and everything in between, which I think is actually a fair analogy to life. See, not every moment in life is gripping or interesting or meaningful. In fact, quite the opposite. Many of the moments in life are ordinary. That's why we call them ordinary. The thing that Moby Dick captures, I think, is the nature of pure evil in Captain Ahab and in his pursuit of the whale and in him getting the thing that he wants and that ultimately being his demise. But I think in order to get us there, Moby Dick needs every single page, and every single moment to set us up with enough understanding to know what's going on when the important things happen. See, it's why I hate book summaries so much. The idea that you could, in 15 minutes, replicate what Herman Meville did in 400 pages. It's why I think reading any book, but especially a book of fiction, is actually an immense act of faith. 
It's you saying that you trust the author enough that they knew what they were doing when they included every single word on every single page in every single chapter in the book. And that each one of those moments and beats is necessary to summarize the story as a whole. It couldn't be done in any less time. So that gets into the heart of why I don't just love fiction as entertainment, but why I think it's important. There are truths in life that don't neatly fit into a bolded list. They don't neatly land in an executive summary or fit into a YouTube video like this one, where I can quickly and easily tell you seven of my favorite works of fiction and a brief look about what they mean to me, but not one that is the same thing as experiencing it for yourself. See, there are truths that you can communicate through bolded lists. And for those truths, we tend to prefer mediums that are easily accessible. The reality of books, as much as I love them, is that they are anything but easily accessible. Reading a book takes a lot of work. But in the process of doing that work, you don't just download information into your brain matrix style. Because I think we have mediums like podcasts or YouTube videos or quick summaries in order to teach us information like that. Fiction teaches us lessons of humanity that really can't be learned so much as they can be experienced. And when you go along the ride with some of your favorite heroes, when you see them confront some of your favorite villains, and you see them succeed or fail, depending on the nature of the story, you're not just learning things about that hero. You are in some ways embodying them, experiencing what they experienced, and discovering the lessons that they discovered, the kind of lessons you can only learn in fiction. Hey everybody, my name is Zach from the Heroes Journal. Thank you so much for watching that. I love fiction, I love stories, so this is so much fun for me to talk about. I would love to know what fiction and nonfiction books have most impacted you. We read every single comment, so I would love to see some suggestions, get some things from my reading list, and know which books, whether I talked about them or not, have been most impactful in your life. We created the Heroes Journal based off of our favorite fandoms and goal setting science along with story theory to help people become the heroes of their story and see their goals in epic quest. So if this video is helpful, you want to learn more about that, you can visit heroesjournal.co. Finally, we make videos every week talking about goal setting psychology, our favorite fandoms, and how story theory plays out in our life. So if this video is helpful to you, you can hit like, subscribe, and we'll see you next week.